Hi, good morning, Forged in Faith Church. Welcome home. Come on in. We're going to find our place in front of a seat here and uh, start some praise and worship in a minute. So who was at Testifier these last two weeks? Amazing, right? So what this made me think of this week is, is the word possibility, right? We worship a God where nothing is impossible for him. In Matthew 19, Jesus was saying, you know, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible, right? My mother last year was healed of cancer completely, right? Right out of the gate. We did that in this house with our God, right? He came in. He does whatever we think as a person that this is not possible. We had healings from all sorts of things, suicidal thoughts, from depression, from physical ailments here in this place. Our God came home here and joined us here. So, you know, um, <laughs> my son plays football and, and it's not a great team. Uh, and so <laughs> he's amazing. He is. He's amazing. But, you know, the other 50 kids, not so much. Um, so they varsity team got beat really bad the last two weeks and um, so Friday night's not an exciting time and we go and the, the guys are getting just pummeled the other team is so physical and so like in their face and just has them psyched out and that's our life right you have stuff going on it, it psychs you out you kind of forget for a minute that you're a Christian <laughs> and you're like wait a minute I have this God this King that I come in here every week and worship well where is he on Wednesday morning right and so Carson's team has to go and take a second beating on on Saturday mornings for the JV. It's their time to get kicked around. And last week I was watching them and, and the whole team was just like moving down the sideline like this. They were meandering and, and I, so I went to Carson this week on the way to the game. I said, listen, you have to go in there with an attitude of war that you've already won this. Nobody yeah. meanders pointlessly into battle. Okay, so when you are here and you are in this place and we are praising our God, we're going to war. We're going to war for what's coming on Wednesday. But we are claiming the victory with what is coming on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, next year, next decade. This is a process of us building our army, worshiping a king that we know is capable of doing anything above and beyond what we even imagine. So as we go into worship today, let's go to war and let's claim our victories. Come on.
great things. There's no way. 
weapon too strong There is nothing for God that's impossible There's no mountain too high No valley too low There's no fear that I have He doesn't already know There's no problem too big There's no weapon too strong There is nothing for God
declare this with me now. There's freedom in this place. Freedom reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace. Thank you, Jesus. Falling on every face. There is freedom, my Jesus. My Jesus. My Jesus. opportunity today a dear friend and spiritual mother in the faith has the opportunity to go to Mombasa Kenya and it's a wonderful opportunity because she is going to be teaching on the authority of the believer and healing so this is Darlene this is my friend Darlene Tibbins yes so we're gonna stand in agreement today and pray for her trip, but I would also ask that when a missionary's out in the field, that that's a time in which we also need to stand in the gap and continue to cover her in prayer, okay? So Father, I ask today for my spiritual mom, Darlene, I thank you for her warrior heart and her evangelist spirit to go and tell, Father God. And I thank you for the love and the comfort that she gives to so many, for the children here, and for her love for so many in Africa, God. I thank you for the way that she speaks about these people with passion in her heart. And Lord, I ask that when she goes, that she will have signs and wonders that follow her, Father God. I ask that the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon her and her teaching, that she would train and equip and edify the body, God, to rise up in Africa, that a mighty move of God will come, and that things will be spoken and decreed in the Spirit, and that she would just be a messenger, Father God, a good servant, and that she would plant good seed, Father God, and it will be a harvest, that she is preparing a harvest in Africa. So we thank you for this trip. We thank you for this assignment. We thank you for the honor and this opportunity. Pour out overflow over her in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids are dismissed. <laughs> Welcome to Forged in Faith Church. We're so glad you're here today. Here at Fortune Faith Church, we want to be a home where everyone can be spirit-filled, love others, know God, and serve the world. If you are new here, please fill out a connect card located in the seat back in front of you so that we can let you know about life groups, upcoming events, and how to get connected. Just make sure you place it in the offering container before the end of service. You can also check out fortunefaithchurch.com for more ways to be involved here at the Forge. We can't wait to get to know you better, and our prayer is that God speaks to you in a specific way this morning. We are all so excited to partner with you on your journey as we all become forged in faith. Everyone is throwing out their opinion. Everyone is sure that they are right. And there is a message in this book that is so needed for this generation. But the question is, is are we going to be humble enough to understand this message, to receive this message. Now, most Christians are pretty familiar with the book of Job, but 
we see it as, okay, that's the book I turn to when I go through difficult times because I think, you know what, what I'm going through doesn't compare to what Job's going through. And, and Job was able to glorify God during those trials, during those difficult times, so I'm gonna do the same thing. And so it's become this book that is about trials. But if you really look at the book of Job, if you really study, and I hope you do, you're gonna see that this is a lot bigger than just a book you turn to when trials are happening. You have to understand the core message of Job because this is about the meaning of life. Okay, this book is about the whole reason why you exist. And if you miss it, if you miss that core truth, you're gonna be so confused in your life. Well, good morning, Fourth and Face Church. My name is Bill. I'm the Life Group Coordinator here with my wife, and this is my pastor friend, Kurt. How you doing, Bill? Good morning to morning. you, and good morning to you, everyone. For first-time guests, we're so happy that you're here today with us. Uh, we just want to welcome you and help you feel more comfortable and safe and loved while you're in here. At the end of the service, we'd just like to say thank you as well. Back at the welcome station, where you'll be able to meet a greeter back there, we'd love to put a wonderful gift in your hand if you're new here, and uh, say thank you for coming. Well, as you saw the video uh, Life Group Series is finally here after all the preparation all summer long. It starts next Wednesday here at the church. Five of the groups are going to meet here. And uh, what we want to express is really the love of God and the love for each other. And one of those ways is to join a life group. So we have a life group for everyone. There is a men's group here. There is a ladies group here. There is a young adults group here. There's a couples group here. And did I miss one? Anyone. Anyone's group. And it's standing right next to me. He is the guy that's doing the anyone's group. And there is one Mulligan. group off campus uh, that my wife and Lori Miller are doing at our house. That's a ladies group. And uh, I asked Pastor Vince if I could have permission instead of forgiveness. And I'm going to give one shameless plug for the shirts. There's a sign-up sheet yes. for the shirts. It helps the food bank. That's the last you'll hear of it. They're beautiful. Yes, and I forgot to mention before... Well, I forgot, I got to talk about Pastor Johnny. Now, on Wednesday night. Mm. Mulligan for me. Right? One uh, for one. We're nervous. <laughs> Wednesday night, it's not babysitting, it's kids' ministry. At the church, Johnny, Pastor Johnny is going to be teaching about the books of Job. He's going to have games and objective lessons that will really bring the scriptures alive for your child while they're here. While we're in here talking about Job, your children will do the same thing in the back. So, I'd like to see you here then. Thanks, Bill. Sorry. So what I did forget to mention is for first time guests, you'll see in the seat backs in front of you a card that looks just like this. If you could fill it out with your name and information and put it, drop it back in that welcome bucket back or as the offering comes forward, you can drop it in the offering or you can actually give it back to the welcome station as you're on your way out and we receive your gift. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, this Tuesday at seven is going to reignite our carbon program with Pastor Izzy. So this is a program for the youth here. And she is going to have every week, there's going to be food, there's going to be activities, some off-site things are going to happen. And also one of the most exciting things is that we are going to organize here a special group for the children to go over on a missionary journey. So a first time thing, a wonderful thing, a desire is a prayer for it. And uh, we're looking all forward to that. Mark your calendars for November 5th from 2 to 5. That's a Sunday afternoon. The Forge will host its first family fall festival. There'll be food. There'll be games, um, face painting, hay rides. It'll be a lot of things. Invite your neighbors who might have kids to bring them to the church November 5th from 2 to 5 right here. And that'll be the first fall family festival for Forge and Faith Church. Yeah, we're looking forward to that, definitely. So now comes to our giving moment, and I wanted to mention that there are a few ways now that we can give. One of the most exciting ways is if you write a check or you do a bank draft, it can now be written out to Forged in Faith Church. So we are one divisive... 
unity in our church here. There's a couple different apps that you can give through. One of them is a green app. It's called Tithely. You can find both of these actually on your Play Store or if you have Apple. I don't know what that's called. Just the App Store maybe. Um, but you can download the green one to, to, for specific tithing. And then you can also download the blue app, search for Fours in Faith. It's, it's Tithely as well, but you'll see Tithely and it's a blue logo as you see behind me. And that one will allow you to search for Forge in Faith, get sermons, uh, videos. There'll be Pastor, uh, Pastor Vince's messages can be up there as well. So those are two ways that you can give. Um, and let me see if I'm um, forgetting anything on all of the wonderful ways that we can give. You can still give through the website if, if you would wish. And you can also uh, write the bank drafts out to Forge in Faith Church with the address uh, behind me. Or, or excuse me, through the, you can also do it through texting to uh, give to the number down the bottom of the screen here, 855-643, and so on. So with, a, with this, we're going to end with a video here, and then we're going to begin with Pastor Vince's wonderful message today. So thanks for coming out, guys. It is so great to be here with all of you here today here at The Forge. We have been having such an exciting time throughout this entire month. This is an exciting day. You know why? Because God is here. Anytime God is here, it is exciting. One of the reasons that it's exciting when God is here is you never know what he's going to do. <laughs> you never know when he's going to show up. You never know when he's going to touch a heart. You never know when he's going to change a life, when he's going to heal a body, when he's going to heal a mind, heal a spirit. And, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but there's this big tub up here next to me. Uh, you know, that, that's not usually a normal feature for our church. That means it is also Baptism Sunday. Yeah. So we're going to celebrate for people who have made a commitment in their heart to the Lord Jesus is something God's already done in their heart, and then they're going to get water baptized in the way that God commanded us all to do, and he himself did. Can't wait to be able to do that and celebrate with those that are being water baptized now. During the service, anytime, if God is speaking to you, and it's particularly if you're someone who was only baptized when you were very, very little, and it really wasn't your decision, it was your parents' decision, or you were never baptized at all, then I encourage you to get water baptized. You don't have anything to worry about. You can just go back there and see Rachel and Anita at any time during the service. Where are they? There's Anita over there, and Rachel is also someplace. I don't know where she went. Where'd she go? She's her, She's probably in the bathroom. That's what always happens. You know, she's in the bathroom. But uh, she. Um, uh, but you can go back and see them. And we have changes of clothes, and we have everything that you need to be able to get water baptized after the service today. All right. So this is a series, as you saw in that video there. You saw that this is first to fierce, and first to fierce is a series that is about spiritual growth. It is about what we sometimes call discipleship. It is about growing in God to become, as we say here at the Forge, a spirit-filled follower of Jesus. That's one of the things. That's one of the most significant things that the Forge believes in is to help all of us, every one of us, grow in Christ. And if you notice these little props that we have around. This is another thing we love to do here. They kind of demonstrate a couple of different contexts of the message series that we're in. You see these little guys that are climbing up a mountain over there because sometimes growing in Christ and becoming more like him is something that we initiate. It's like climbing up a mountain towards the things that God has for us. There's also trophies because Paul refers to, of course, in Ephesians or Philippians, he talks about it being like a race that he is dedicated to running in his life. That's about our will. But then we also have these plants here. We have seeds and we have plants that get bigger and bigger all the way to the tall ones and that's about some of the things that we we grow in are really really about our initiative some things that God does in our life that grows us supernaturally he does he does it doesn't have to do with our will but he does it within us and so this is all things to remind us of spiritual growth but we are all intending on being the first on running the race, on wanting to become all the things that God has, has purposed us to become, and that is why it is called First to Fierce. Now today, we are talking about holiness. It's a word, what's the real meaning of holiness? It's a word that we sometimes 
misinterpret and misunderstand in regards to God. We have an idea of a part of it, but we don't necessarily have the whole. Now, I remember I was a youth, I've been a youth pastor for a long time in my life, and uh, there was a, a girl in, in one of my former youth groups, uh, and her name was Anya, and she was a star student. She was actually, I think maybe the year after, maybe two seasons after, Pastor Isabella uh, was in Bar and Bat Baraka, the big class that we've been talking about. It's going to be starting next Sunday. We're so excited for all of the middle schoolers that are going to be a part of Bar and Bat Baraka. But uh, she was, it was a couple of years later, and she was just somebody who really wanted to press in and do what God wanted her to do. She was a real, she wanted to be like uh, at the head of the class. She wanted to, to memorize everything. She wanted to have the right answers. She studied. She was just that kind of kid, right? So this one time we're on a bus, I forget where we were going, it was some sort of a youth outing we were doing, and I hear this big commotion and something was like crashed on the, bu- on the floor of the bus behind me, and I turn around instinctually, and Ani's there, and she's got this big look on her face, and she's like, she says, don't look at me, I'm not being holy. And, and after that, I didn't even know what she did. I didn't care. I was just laughing too hard. I was just like, that is absolutely precious. You know? So she's like, we have an idea about what holiness is. Now, here's another thing that uh, I'll tell you, too, is uh, something just to give you some insight about me, is that uh, when I'm driving places, I put a lot of miles on the car. I'm going here, seeing this person, meeting with this person, going to a hospital, things like that, different times I'm putting a lot of miles. And uh, I like to listen to a lot of worship music in the car, and I enjoy that. I love of worshiping God. I love listening to various types of worship music. Um, but sometimes when I'm going down the road, I just, I don't know, when I'm doing worship music, my mind wanders and I, I, I do some funny types of things. Like, um, you know, does anybody remember this man that's going to be on your screen here? This man up here? Go back to that one about the man. The, 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 anybody know who this is? This is Aaron Neville, all right? So uh, Aaron Neville was a, was a pop star, you know, from years ago. He has kind of a high falsetto voice. You may not remember his name, but you'd remember an awful lot of his music if you heard it. As soon as you heard his voice, oh, I know who he is. His probably his most famous hit, you know, was for, it was a duet, you know, with Linda Ronstadt, you know? And it's like, I don't know much, but I know I love you. And that may be all I need to know. Right, we probably always say that, right? Yeah, okay. So, hang on. So, sometimes I'm going down the road, though, and I just start thinking, like singing praise song in Aaron Neville's voice. That's cause, you know? So, you know, like, I'll love, please light the fire. That burns with holy fear. Replace the love of my first love. And I forget the next line. Yeah. Now, I appreciate the applause, but a lot of you would probably be like, I cannot believe he did that. Is he my pastor? You are making fun of God's music, you know? And maybe you're right. I don't know. But I think if Jesus were next to me, if I asked him if he was offended, he'd be like, I'm offended, but not for me. I'm offended for Aaron Neville. I mean, his stuff is good. That was awful. Don't ever do that again. So we think of things that are sacred. We think of things in terms of holiness, right? We think of them in terms of like this, this perspective of purity when we think of holiness. And it, it is a part of the story when you think of God's holiness, especially in terms of spiritual growth. We think in terms of what we need to become as a follower of Christ. We think of holiness and we get the kind of the concept of being pure and being righteous. But it's so much more than that, especially in what God desires us to have within our spirits. So where do we get this perspective of holiness where it is absolutely just about the purity, just about the righteousness? Don't look at me. I'm not being holy. Where does that kind of concept come into our life? Well, it comes actually from, in context, scriptures that, are, that speak to that very thing. Here's a couple of them that probably come to mind when we think about God's holiness. Revelation 15.4 says, Who will not fear... O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. 
All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Here's another famous passage, a famous passage which reveals the calling of Isaiah the prophet. His calling says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, and each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Now those are scriptures that speak to God's holiness and they're absolutely true and they're beautiful and they're right and they're, they're awesome. But... There is something to keep in mind when we are choosing to run the race, to become a first to fierce, to be like God wants us to be. And that is that we have to look at every scripture in order to have a whole idea of who God is in the context of scripture. You've heard me, you guys have said this with me before. I'm going to have you say this again. Everybody say a text without a context is a pretext. Now, what does that mean? A text without a context is a pretext. What it means is that sometimes we read portions of the Bible, a particular scripture. There's within it maybe something we understand, maybe something we don't quite get. Maybe it's an ecstatic kind of thing like what Isaiah experienced or the book of Revelation. And we read it and we we don't necessarily understand it in all of its context. Now, what we do when that happens is we begin to try to understand it and we bring our own meaning to it. And sometimes Sometimes that either can, in a case of holiness, I think it just gets us maybe not the full picture, but other times it can put us in a place in which we're completely misinterpreting the scriptures themselves. And we do this, there's nothing wrong with this, we do this in life all of the time. Have you ever been watching, on, looking online, you see a picture of a cute animal or something like that, but you don't know what it is? Or you've been at the zoo and you see an animal and you haven't recognized it yet. You haven't walked up to read the little marquee thing. And in those cases, what do you do when you look at an animal like that? You say, oh, look at that animal. And what, do you search, what is it? Is it like a cat? Is it like a dog? Is it more like a giant rodent? What am I looking at here? We try to make sense of it from what we already know. Now, sometimes when we're reading the scriptures, we tend to do the same thing. And that is a part of the process. But if we stop and we don't look at fully in context, we can misunderstand what it really is means. And that's why we're going to be looking at holiness in a bit in depth today. So there's many different types of context. We're going to do a little bit of linguistic context on the word holiness in a minute. But the real thing I want you to keep in your minds today as we're talking about holiness is that we need to understand it from the context of the whole of Scripture. Rather than just one verse, one placement, we need to look at the entire Bible to get a true picture of this extremely weighty concept called holiness, especially if we want to include it in our desire to grow as spiritual followers of Jesus. Now, language, a little bit of language here. So two words for holiness in Scripture, two main words for holiness in Scripture. In the Hebrew, which would have been the one that's used in the Old Testament, it is kodesh. And Kodesh is where we mainly get our concept of what we usually think about when we think of holiness and God being holy. And that is separateness, to be set apart. That's what Kodesh means. God is holy. He is separate. He is set apart. If we're to be holy, then we must be set apart. That's a common phrase. A lot of people have heard that before. It comes from Kodesh. But here's the Greek word. And the Greek word, which would be the one used in the New Testament, is hegiasmos. And hegiasmos means sanctification. Right now, sanctification. Right? Big word, long word. What does that mean? Sanctification means the whole process that we're actually talking about in this series. Sanctification is everything that is required in our life following Jesus to become more like him. It's all the lessons. It's everything that we are to learn to be more like, to be more godly in its entirety in our life. A lot of times you might hear people say, I am sanctified, right? 
Now, the reality is, is that none of us can truly claim we're already sanctified because sanctification never ends. You never really arrive. Now, you kind of can say that in the same way that you can say, I am saved, right? I'm saved. And that is true. When you come to believe in Jesus as your Savior, then you are saved. But it's also true that you're being saved from sin even now. And it's also true that when Jesus returns and the new heaven and the new earth and so on, we will all finally be saved from the presence of sin. So it doesn't really end. Salvation doesn't end. Sanctification is like that. We're continuing in our process of discipleship with God. And that is the same word that is used mostly in the New Testament for holiness rather than just referring to one single part of it. Now, why is it so important for us to continue in this process of sanctification, of holiness? Well, the Bible actually says in Leviticus 11.44, says this, For I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves therefore, dedicate yourselves to me therefore, and be holy. Why? For I am holy. He tells us to be holy as he is. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 goes and says this, gives this indication that does talk about purity. He says this, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. He hasn't called us to say, I'm abandoned to God's grace. I can do whatever I want because I'm forgiven, so I'm just going to endure. I'm going to go through all these bad behaviors. No, that's not true. He didn't call us for impurity, but he does call us for holiness. And what is holiness? Becoming more like him in all ways, not just in one. However, purity is very important, and we are going to talk about that for a good bit of today because you can't separate purity from holiness. Now, here's the main idea of today's message, and I want to share with you this one because it's pretty special. It's a pretty unique one. This main idea came to me while I was in 8 a.m. prayer about three weeks ago. Series are always planned here, message series and things. I do it ahead of time. I ask God to reveal things to me. There's a lot of advantages in doing that. But this particular day, the, the, the main idea came to me during 8 a.m. prayer. And by the way, everybody's invited. If you want to come to 8 a.m. prayer, every Thursday happens here. That's the time in which we just press into God. We listen to worship music. We listen to what he's saying. And then we share with one another what God is saying to us so that we pray, therefore, we pray about what he wants us to pray about rather than what we want to pray about. It's heaven on earth, right? So you're always invited. But at this time, this is what God spoke to me. He was speaking to me about his holiness. And I didn't even know that I was going to be including it in our series this time. But he says, as he was calling about holiness, this is what he said. Now, I added the word biblical for this morning. But he said this, holiness is to be completely pure and consistently accessible. His holiness is to be completely pure and consistently accessible. Now that almost seems to stand in opposition to the context of being set apart. And that, I believe, when God spoke that to me, he was very intentional. And I've been, spe I've been praying to him, I've been listening to him, and I've been studying about what he meant ever since that moment. Now here's what I want to share with you. Let's go back to that first verse there, that verse in Thessalonians. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. So again, purity is a big part of what we're to receive when we are pursuing holiness. Now remember this series. We've got things that are a part of our will. When we think about holiness, when we think about what God wants from us and us becoming more like him, we can easily think about it's about our will. We choose to do certain things. We don't choose to do others. But holiness is also like the plants, gives to us. How is it? You might decide, I am not going to participate. I'm not going to, to do this particular activity as I had been at one time, as a matter of desiring to be more like what I know holiness demands of me. But often for people, even after they then make that decision, even if they're successful in making that decision, it is God that often takes away our desire to do that thing. And that is something that is from him. And when that desire, that lack of desire comes into our heart as a gift from God, that's the gift of holiness that he has now given to us. 
But everybody say this after me. Everybody say this statement. No gift that God gives us is an end unto itself. God doesn't give us any gift, no matter its form, whether it be purity and holiness or it be a spiritual gift. Whatever God gives to us directly, he doesn't give it to us so it just is, oh, isn't that pretty? Oh, let's just kind of display it so that everybody can see. No, 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 no. It's much more like when your wife at Christmas time gives you a really great tool. Right? And you love the tool, you're happy for the tool, and then you realize that the tool that she gave you relates directly to the thing you need to fix or the project she's been asking you to do for a really long time. And you say, thank you so much. Thanks. I get the message. I do. That's how God is when he gives us a gift. It's like, oh, thank you, God. Okay. Oh, now I get the point. Okay. So purity, even in itself, the gift of purity when God gives, us, gives it to us is for a reason that is outside of just being released from that desire. Now, I think that, especially when we talk about purity, it manifests itself in different ways for men and women. I think what we have to overcome is slightly different when we're pursuing purity. I think the way we think of purity is a bit different, and I think it yields different things. All right, everybody, just biblically speaking, want to make sure you understand that men and women are different, made differently. There's only man, only women. God made them for a specific intent. We have very much in common, but there are certain distinctions between us, and it shall always be that way. Now, when it comes to men, and you say to a man, purity, you think of purity, I think that most of our minds go to, I need to be sexually pure. I think that one of the things that men struggle with is to be sexually pure in our thoughts and our mind, imaginations, and what we do. I believe that that's what we say. We were pure, want to be holy. I need to be not, not engage in what Paul talked about so often, which is sexual immorality. Now, Here's what results. Here's what comes out of God giving us that he removes from us a desire for that specific challenge to our purity. What happens is when a man becomes pure in that way, they become more confident. A man who is pure is confident. But it doesn't just stop there. A man who is pure and is confident then begins to become bold. They become a leader. They begin to pray bold prayers. They begin to take faith. They have a purity over that thing, so now they have confidence, and then they begin to be bold and show even more initiative to take care of their families, to be able to pray in the spirit in a way that brings results. I think, and by experience of working with men and women for so many years, I think that women, when you talk about purity, certainly the sexual morality thing comes to mind. But I think what women talk to me more about when they face a brokenness is it's more about the relational brokenness that often happens with a struggle over their tongue, what you say, how you treat and I think that it's, it's, it's something that when it's overcome, it produces something similar to confidence, but it produces in women, I think it produces peace. When their tongue, just like James tells us, so hard to take, when a woman has a tame tongue, when a woman does not speak out against others, when a woman does not complain, when a woman prays, I think it produces peace. Why? Because women feel such a, 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 they're multitaskers, right? You all do so much. There's so many needs. And it's so hard to be able to have peace. I believe that purity produces peace. But here's what I think the peace yields then. It goes even deeper. A woman who is, has, 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 is pure now has peace. And that peace produces security. They are secure. So you have a bold man and a secure woman in times when purity is a gift that God has implanted in your hearts. Now, when that happens, when you have boldness and when you have that security, it is because of one underlying factor that is the same for men and women. Why can the man be so bold when they're pure? Because the realization of becoming more godly, of having purity in your life, helps them realize the burden's not just on my shoulders. 
I know that God is with me. So a man can now be bold and pray bold things and have an imagination that God is going to do the things that he has promised to do and be said about that. It's not just my responsibility. I know God is right here with me. Why can a woman now be secure no matter how many different things are pulling on her, no matter how many different things might be going in their life? How do they have secure? Because they realize that the ability to be able to do those things is not just on her shoulders. It's not just her responsibility. They know from their purity and becoming more godly. They know that God is standing right there taking the burden off of them. So purity releases burdens. Purity is very much an important part of holiness. Now, speaking of that peace concept here, Hebrews 12, 14 says this, strive for peace with everyone and for holiness. Here comes this Christmas gift again from God. Okay, so now I'm finally holy. Now I have security. Now I'm bold. Great. Not that's not the ultimate point for this, though. Well, I gave it to you for a purpose. Here's the thing for the tool. This is, and for holiness, with which, with, without which no one will see the Lord. So why do we need to be holy? Because God is holy. Why do, we, why do we want to be holy? Because of what it produces in our life. It produces confidence, boldness, peace, security, better relationships. But why do we want those things? Why does he give us those desires? So that people will see him without holiness, without what it produces in our lives, then people aren't going to see God. And the whole reason he has placed us here is to reveal him, his, his character and his personhood to the world. Holiness, purity, it's an important thing. It's a part of it, but... It's not the whole. Now, here's the first truth that I want to contemplate after all those things are now laid down as a foundation for this. Here's the first truth today. Holy purity continuously refines your focus into God's perspective. So we become more like God. That's discernment. More like God, we become more aware of that which in this world is real and of him. Holy purity produces that in our lives. You know, uh, there's, there's a, at the mints, the, the national mints, where there's money that can be recirculated, currency can be recirculated. Most of it is taken out of circulation. But there are some that is recirculated into our economy. And, you know, there are still people that are employed to be able to count the money. People, I mean, machines do an awful lot. But there's still people there that are there to count the money. Do you know how they train these people and what they're there specifically for? They're there specifically not for totalism, but they're they're there to be able to find counterfeits. And why they're, they're find, how they're able to find counterfeits is for significant portions of their time, they are put in an isolated room where they count only genuine currency, only the real thing. And the reason they only count the real thing is that the very second that their fingers touch something that is not that, they know it immediately. And that's something that even the most complex machines are not as quick to be able to catch and not as accurate as the human beings are at being able to do so. When we are pure, when we are holy, when we are, are, are becoming godly, we become much more sensitized to that which is not godly. This is a really beautiful thing, especially for those of us who struggle on making decisions. If you're here today and you struggle to make decisions, like, man, it just seems like every single time I make a decision, everything goes wrong. You're the kind of person that's like, I don't even go to restaurants where the menu is too big because I just don't even like making decisions. Right? If you're that kind of sister, then maybe focus your, God, show me, help me to be more pure in my thoughts, in my words, and in my actions. Where do I need to dedicate myself to grasp this aspect of holiness? By doing so, you become more aware of that which is not of him. The moment that it comes into your life, the moment that a choice comes, you'll be able to be more discerning because of the purity in your life. Now, here is where we balance out that holiness. Wanted to talk to it for a whole lot about that purity aspect of it because it's very real. But there's a whole other aspect to it that brings us into the time and the mind frame and the expression of Jesus. We want to become spirit-filled followers of Jesus. And here comes the fullness of what holiness really means. Here's the second truth today. 
God's holiness is shown through us by all the fruits of the Spirit. Here's the verse, Romans 6.22. In the whole of Scripture, here's Romans. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. That's that word, sanctification, hegiesmos. Paul uses there, holiness, sanctification. All the fruit you receive from sin being taken out of your life, from purity being there, all this fruit that you're, what is the fruit? Well, it goes beyond what I was talking about for boldness and confidence. What does the scriptures actually talk about in terms of fruit? Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. It's the fruit that the Holy Spirit gives to us. Now, let me ask you this. Who can be loving and yet completely set apart? Who can possibly express kindness but be separated? Who can be good to others but be apart from everyone? Reality is, is that none of us can. Holiness, as it was defined in the times of the Old Testament that focused in on the purity and the distance between God's nature and our own, now has been transformed by Jesus coming and dying in this world for our sin, paying the penalty, and then releasing the Holy Spirit and his gifting and his fruit into our lives. Because of those realities, we now are not, not, we don't have to stay apart and isolated, but we actually have an obligation to be involved with, to be, be associated with, to be in relationship with other people. And that in and of itself is not a, just a separate portion of who God is. That too is his holiness. That is sanctification. You see, there is a set apartness in regards to behavior. We don't necessarily engage in or do certain things that others might do. But that's only one portion of holiness. The sanctification process that we're all here to be. The first of fierce process that he has engaged us in. The reason he puts these gifts in our spirit as an ultimate objective of us to go deeper, do more, love better. All of that is holiness. So when he says, be holy for I am holy, he's not just talking about your behavior. He's not just talking about what you think or do in your mind and your heart and your spirit. He is also talking about how well you love, how well you show kindness, how well you are a part of the lives of those around you. Here's the ultimate proof of that as well. It comes from the gospel of Jesus. The moment that Jesus died and what happened. Matthew records it in Matthew chapter 27 verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The curtain tore in two in the temple. And what was the separation? What did that, that curtain separate from the main body of the temple, from that room beyond? What was that room called? That room was called the Holy of Holies. Jesus, by what he has done, redefined holiness from a place that is separate, a place that is inaccessible, a place that is just meant for him and him alone, into a place where all are welcome, all need to come into the presence of God, to be able to discover his love, to be able to see who he is, and to be able to be unified with them. When Jesus was here on this earth, he said to the disciples who didn't see him die yet, who were still living under under the old covenant who had not received the Holy Spirit he said to them I call you friends was Jesus not being holy then he was was he not being God then he absolutely was in fact he was defining holiness for us 
While we were still sinners, he loved us. So holiness, if you want to be first to fierce, yeah, there is an aspect of that that is about purity. There is an aspect of that that is about how, about our behavior. And we should initiate climb mountains to be able to overcome some of our temptations. We should run a race to be able to see those things placed behind us because we have confidence that God has given us victory to overcome sin. Yes, we should do those things. And yes, we should have pursue God so that the desire of our hearts are transformed and changed. But it's not just about that and holiness. We're not being holy if all that happens. That's only part of it. True holiness happens when we are completely pure, but we are consistently accessible to all those that may have need of knowing who God is, to serving others, to expressing His heart and His grace unless we make ourselves consistently available to do those things, then we aren't really being holy. Not as God defined it. And that's true no matter how well you behave. Now, what does that really mean then and translate to for us today, right now in this room, Fortune Faith? Well, there's a few things. We talked about life groups today. Now our mission here is to forge spirit-filled followers of Jesus who, first thing, love others. Love others. Best way that you can love others is by being consistently accessible to others. So we appeal to you. Don't prioritize other things. It's so easy to prioritize other stuff. But pursue God by being accessible, by loving other people. The Bible instructs us to do good to each other, especially those in the family of God. So love each other. Join a life group. Be a part of those relationships where when you are going through life and you're facing challenges, somebody can pick you up. But you're also available to love others, form those relationships so that you might be holy. Loving others is just as much a part of, of being holy as what you do and what you don't do. The kind of sin that you avoid. It's just as valid. And if you want to be holy like him, participate in things like that. Serving others is important. It's important to serve all those who are in need. In our very own church, we have such a need right now for people who will serve the younger part of our own generation. In our kids' ministry, in our youth ministry, we need people to help. And if we set ourselves apart and say, no, I'm just going to go, that's not being holy. I understand it's a matter of calling for some, but somebody's got to be called. Someone has to be called to help in those areas and to be able to bring holiness to the younger portion of our generation here on earth. Holiness. It's not just about behavior. It's about the position of our heart and the connection to others. They're inseparable. In fact, if we get in front of God one day, which we all will, and we begin to argue a case, which we may or may not necessarily have to do, But if we were in front of him and we just claimed how well we behaved, I think he would say, yeah, but how well did you love others? He would say, you only got a portion of who I am. You only understood half of what holiness really is. So let's be all of it. Let's be all holy. Let's be the people that God wants us to be. Let's pursue him in purity in our hearts. Let's pursue that because we know the benefits that it brings. But then let's also not isolate, but engage with people. Love others. 
Serve them. Share about who he is. Invite people to come to meet him. Talk about our faith so that we all can truly be holy as the Bible defines it. Now, if you're here this morning, you may be here and maybe you've, uh, maybe you've, you've not made that first part of the commitment there. You've not really said, you know, Jesus, I, I believe that I want to be pure. And the first part of being pure, the first part to getting victory over the sins in your life, no matter what they might be, is to remember what was accomplished when that veil was torn and what, who did that. And that was Jesus. He died for your sins. If you're here today and you've never confessed a faith in Jesus Christ and he is here, he is ready, he wants to forgive you, he wants to set you right, he wants to give you that gift of purity in your life and it is because of what he has done. That's where it begins. If you're here today and maybe you haven't been walking with God for a long while, it's been a bit, it's been some time since you've concerned yourself with the issues of purely walking humbly with your God. And he's right here again for you. He wants you to come home. He wants you to return. He wants you to come back. He wants to, 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 to surround you with forgiveness so that that grace in your heart overwhelms you with his love. There is no condemnation in him. There is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because of that, in that same scripture, it says this that nothing can separate us from the love of God. No matter how long it's been since you've been in a church, no matter how long it's been since you've walked with him, nothing can separate you from his love. Why? Because he's holy. So, if you're here this morning, what I encourage you to do is... Uh, to just affirm your faith here today. Let's put our hands out in front of us to receive a gift from him. So, to just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner, but I know that I am forgiven by you. You died on the cross for me, and you rose from the dead because of your holiness, I am forgiven and loved. Make me holy, God. Show me who to love. Give me the gifts of purity in my soul. My life is yours. In Jesus' name. Now, if that's the first time that any of you have ever said that prayer, or if it's been a long while since you've said a prayer like that and you've returned to him, then you need to know that the holy angels and the holy of holies right at this moment are exalting and praising God. And they are saying your name. They are thanking God that you are whole. And now nothing can separate you from his love for all eternity. All right, now, if you're here this morning and you're thinking, you know what? I need to take another step of faith. I need to take another step toward holiness. I need to be more like God. Be holy as he is holy. And part of that is baptism. Then this would be a time that you want to go back and you want to get all changed and ready to go. We'd love to, ce to celebrate it with you. Everybody else, while that's happening, let's ra ri rise to our feet. And let's go ahead and sing out and worship God in this moment. And then we'll celebrate baptisms together.